Hello, my friends. Today, we're going to watch Colin Albert's testimony while observing his body language. But it is important to remember, number one, anyone would be nervous testifying, especially on a case with so much attention. Also, he's behind a witness stand, so we have limited information when it comes to body language. Number two, we're not here to accuse anyone or confirm deceit. We don't have all the facts. Personally, I don't think either side has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that they are correct. So all we're doing is watching, we are observing, and we're trying to add a little bit of sense of humor to it all. Number three, although I will point out some of the significance of certain micro expressions we're going to see, body language is unique to each individual. And what we really can do is pay attention to clusters or when there's a lot of things happening at the same time. And at that point, we ask ourselves, what triggered that response? What was the question here? So for example, as we watch our first clip, pay attention to the person's face or body right after they finish responding. Did it do anything? Some of what we're going to see here is itching or disappearing lip lips like that. Disappearing lips is considered to be a response from stress or that something is wrong. So it's interesting because they will respond like, oh, I was there this time and it will disappear. So does that mean anything? I don't know, but if you are an investigator or uh, someone in the interrogation room, it would be an interesting observation to ask more questions. And that's all we're doing. So we're going to get started with a video compilation that I have created for you that I like to call 1210-ish. So let's get started. 1210. You testified that your parents and Brian Higgins arrived shortly after midnight with your sister, correct? Yeah, I believe I said around 12.05, 12.10 in that area. Right around midnight, I would say, maybe 12.05, 12.10-ish. I want to say about after 12, maybe um, 12.10. So sometime around 12.10? Sometime around 12.10, yes. A little before 12, 12-ish. And about how long a car ride is that? generally speaking, from the waterfall to your house up there? Five minutes, seven minutes. And so about what time was it that you got home? Sometime between, I'd say, five past and ten past twelve, something more in that window. <clears throat> and uh, about how long after you got home was, was it that your son got home? I'd say within ten minutes. Yeah, it looks like the exit of the, of the waterfall and we're kind of walking out. Uh, That's how far Brian Oliver, disappearing lips. I would say five five minutes. Again, I'm, I'm the worst with times, but I would say it was around like 12-ish that we kind of said, you know, let's kind of head out um, and head home. I would say 12-ish, approximately. Now, how, how long a drive is that from, from the waterfall to the building? I would say like five or six minutes, give or take. From the time that you walked in and bumped into Colin, sort of before you at home, um, how long was it that he was in the home while you were there? I would say. So how long was he in the home while you were there? Minutes. I would probably say 11.30, 11.45. And do you have any idea? I believe it's me. It, if you're walking in the door at 12.19, it takes you maybe a minute to get upstairs. About a minute. And then you walked up two flights of stairs. Right? Probably ran up the stairs because I was cold. Okay. All right. So you're getting up there around 12.20 or so, correct? Roughly, yeah. And you believe that you do can't off say yes. About 15 minutes later, which would have made it about 12.35. Somewhere around there. All right. Now, when you came home, you would agree with me that your son, Colin Albert, was not home, correct? Not when I first got home. Uh, and in fact, I think your testimony was that uh, 10 minutes after you got home, he opened the bedroom door. I think that's what I said, yeah. Do you want to stick with that? 12.10. I do not remember. I do not remember. I do not remember. I do not remember. These are different times I you don't said remember. that, by the way. So you have no independent recollection as you sit here. The last time you talked to one of your best friends and your cousin about any subject. No, I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember times. No, I don't remember a time. 
This one doesn't even know what time is. 12.10. I really don't know. Well, you're just definitely knows different. 12 so 10. It's probably not the same. Night. You would agree with that. Unless I change, I could have changed my shirt. I do that often. Okay. Unless I change, I could have changed my shirt. I do that often. Okay. Right. Twelve ten. <laughs> Twelve ten. Because oh wow! So he says he changes his shirt often, but apparently he's wearing the same shirt. Somebody pointed that out to me, and I was like, "No way!" And I had to go back and check it out. Day twelve, he's wearing this shirt. Day 13, it looks like he's wearing the same shirt underneath. Now, there's a lot going on in this little clip, and we're going to go over a summary of everything on Saturday, 8 p.m., alive. And I hope you guys come and participate to try to put everything together that we have seen. So what did we see here about his father said, Chris Albert said, oh, I got home at 12, 12.05. And then Colin was home 10 minutes later, right? So that would put Colin home at like 12, 15. Then they showed video of him still at the waterfall at 12, 13, 8 a.m. And you cannot argue with video, sir. So then he was like, all right, fine. I, I went home at like 12, 19. I was home. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. That would put Colin home at 12, 35 a.m. ish. So that that's fine you know it doesn't mean that they're all creating this specific scenario because the last call for alcohol at the waterfall is about 12 ish so it could be that everybody just left around that time and went to their respected homes so doesn't you know i'm not trying to put too much meaning into it but it is interesting that uh, some of these witnesses do seem to be defensive, especially like Chris Albert, Brian Albert. Oh, they really bug me sometimes, even when I'm creating these videos that I have to listen to them over and over and over again to like try to find the right clip for you guys. It's like, dude, can't you just answer yes or no or just stop like putting all these things, qualifiers into it? But that is my blah, blah, blah for another day. Today, we're going to focus on Colin. So starting with Colin, we're going to talk about his baseline. We don't have a lot of information because we don't know Colin in his normal world, right? But what we're going to see here is how did he react initially during the direct examination. Direct examination is supposed to be something that is not hostile because he's supposed to be uh, talking to Lolly, who is on his side, right? He's the one that called Colin to testify. And uh, Colin's going to show some displays of body language and micro expressions that would possibly mean something else in another occasion. So, for example, Colin's going to get to the stand, he's going to show nervousness, he's going to be breathing hard. He's going to say, how are you to Lolly, like all uh, natural, uh, informal. And then Lolly is going to put him right back at, good morning, sir. Uh, so then Colin starts to respond, sir, as well. He's going to do a little bit of tongue juts, which usually says getting away with something, getting caught. But in this case, I think he's just he just does that. Uh, and he's also going to do like um, big swallows, lips pursing, and say, can you repeat that? And I don't remember. Now, the thing is that when he's talking to the prosecutor during the direct, he does say, I don't remember, but he does look genuinely confused and not understanding or maybe not remembering what he's being asked. When it comes to the cross-examination, he's just going to be like, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember, which is like, a little suspicious for us because we're not stupid. And like, for example, when did you talk to Ali last? I don't remember. I don't remember. Come on, sir. Do you remember if it was 10 years ago, five years ago? I don't remember. That's just not true, right? So let's see what his baseline looks like. As we can see here, those are screenshots taken during the direct examination with the tongue juts, the looking up to the right, saying, I don't know, looking genuinely confused, uh, lips pursing, and he does have on the bottom here this way that he looks at the attorneys that are questioning him, very direct look. So 
The first variation is going to be under this trigger here on the right hand side where he's going to answer I'd wave, he'd wave, that's it, that's all we did. But we're going to look at what are the questions that started up, right? So first of all, Lolly is asking him about the kids that Mr. O'Keefe has, and he's going to say they were a lot younger, and he's going to do a shoulder shrug, like, I don't know, like, you know, when you have both shoulders go up, uh, and we're going to read a little bit into what that means. On the middle picture here, he's doing a little bit of a left shoulder. The left is going to be more prominent when uh, he responds to Lolly. Not often. Like, I wouldn't see him often. He's going to do like this. I wouldn't see him often, you know. Just uh, important to remember because we're going to see the significance of that soon. And then when he says he'd wave, I'd wave, that was it. He is going to do a deep, like, breath, which is, uh, could just be stress, could just be anxiety. So let's watch the clip and see if we can catch these things. A lot younger. I don't know the exact age difference, but. Both shoulders. So if you were in high school, they would have been some grade far below. Yes. Now, as far as um, your relationship with Mr. O'Keefe, your neighbor, um, about how often would it be that you would you would see him? Not often. Every I drive by every Left now and then. He'd be outside, and I would wave. Prominent. He'd wave back. That was pretty much it. And, and then the deep breath. Okay. So then let's see what comes next. So the shoulder has an important meaning when one shoulder is moving and not both are doing the shoulder shrug. So let me read it for you, what this book, What Everybody is Saying by John Navarro says. Honest and true response will cause both shoulders to rise sharply and equally. Expect people to give full high shoulder shrugs when they confidently support what they're saying. There is nothing wrong with saying I don't know while both shoulders rise up toward the ear. As discussed previously, this is a gravity-defined behavior that normally signifies the person is comfortable and confident with his or her actions. If you see a person's shoulder only partially rise, or if only one shoulder rises, chances are the individual is not limbically committed to what he or she is saying, and it's probably being evasive and even deceptive. So that is something for us to watch for. Because uh, having the limbic system is going back to our lizard brain, the fight and flight response, things that we do subconsciously and we have no control over, okay? So that is important to keep in mind when it comes to Colin because it is a variation in his body. Were you aware uh, if anyone lived at the house with Mr. Oki? I know his two um, kids that he brought in, adopted, lived there. And I'm not sure who else. And that would have been his niece and his nephew that he adopted, correct? Correct. And where were they in relation to you as far as age? A lot younger. I don't know the exact age difference, but. So if you were in high school, they would have been some grade far below. Yes. Now, as far as um, your relationship with Mr. O'Keefe, your neighbor, um, about how often would it be that you would, you would see him? Not often. Every I'd drive by every now and then he'd be outside and I would wave, he'd wave back. That was pretty much it. So right after that questioning, we're going to go back to how what did you how would you describe him as a person? Okay. So let's take a look at this slide and go over it before we go over the video. So he's going to Continue the left shoulder forward, okay? So his left shoulder is just like more prominent when he's talking about this subject. Uh, he's going to say a nice guy, good guy. His shoulder is going to go like this, and he's going to look to the right. I don't know who he's looking at. Maybe his attorney, maybe somebody from his family. Uh, he is going to be asked at any point in time, did you see Mr. O'Keefe that night in the house? He's going to say no and do a tongue jut which means getting away with something or being caught doing something. But remember, when we do the baseline with Colin, he does a lot of tongue juts. So 
I don't think that we should put a lot of meaning into this one, but it is conveniently right when he talks about Mr. Keep being at the house or not. And another thing that he does here is chewing, which is a sign of nervousness and anxiety. So now let's watch the clip and see if you guys can catch those. And how would you describe Mr. O'Keefe from your perspective as, as far as how would you describe him as a person? A nice guy, a good guy. Now, with respect uh, to Look, somebody bring you back to uh, Fairview Road on January 28th and 29th of 2000. Let me pause here. Because another thing that is going to be interesting is when the attorney starts questioning him about Karen Reed. And he is going to do different things. He's going to raise his eyebrow. The forehead is going to furrow. Uh, he's going to say the same thing. Drive by, I'd wave, she'd wave. And he's going to do the left shoulder again. So let's take a look at his body language when he's talking about Karen. And at that time... In End of January 2022, uh, were you uh, aware of or did you know anybody by the name of Karen? Yes. And how did you know? I knew that she dated uh, Mr. O'Keefe. And had you had any sort of prior interactions uh, with Ms. Reed prior to January 28th? Not that I remember, no. Did you know what she looked like? Not really. Um, as far as any interactions, would that be just sort of driving by the house? Yeah, maybe drive by. Wave. Left shoulder. That was, that was about shrugging it. Shrugging prominently. Showing nervousness. Doing the puckered lips, which is frustration. Now he's itching himself. He's going to look to the right at someone. That was a tongue jot. Disappearing lips. Yes. Like this. Now, as far as that um, sort of reaching out yeah, and the chewing, looking at the jury. Okay. So that was a lot of reactions from Colin Albert talking about Karen Reed. I'm going to make this in slow motion and hopefully we can catch the expressions more from. This is. Do, um, did you know? Did you know what she looked like? So the as eyebrows are raised. Interactions would that be just sort of driving by the house? Yeah. Now the left shoulder. Maybe drive shot. by, wave. That was that was about it. He looks to the right very quickly and starts to chew. The pucker lips. Frustration, leg itch, which is an adapter, pacifying behavior. He does the tongue jaw, which is getting away with something. Then disappearing lips, something is wrong, indicating disapproval, frustration, I have one moment. and possible dishonesty. And then he breaks eye contact, looks down. So let me see what this slide looks like here with some of these in the screenshot. So when he is asked about Karen Reed, which, you know, I don't know what's behind this. And that's why we just observe. Uh, he does the eyebrow raised. It could mean fear, disbelief, disapproval. And then it's combined with the furrowed forehead, which could mean worry, shock, anxiety. So could he be, you know, like, did you know what Karen Reed and did you know her and what she looked like? Uh, disapproval and worry like i don't know because they're talking about the defendant then we have him saying we drive by and you know that's it then we have the left shoulder shrug again which we just saw that it could mean the seats that one then he looks at somebody to the right maybe for approval but he does a lot more here right he does a lot more in this little, little uh, response about Karen Reed and how was the, the interaction with you guys. So he does the, the chewing, then he does the pucker lips, which could indicate frustration. He does the disappearing lips, which is something is wrong. He does the tongue jot. He itches his leg, which is a pacifying behavior. 
because sometimes we are under a stressful situation and the brain is looking for a way out because he is there. He can't get out. We will itch our faces, our head will itch our, our legs. It's a pacifying behavior. Uh, so there's a lot that he showed in this subject. So that would be a trigger for me to ask more questions if I was in a case interrogating him. So here we can see those in the screenshots. He looks at someone to the right. It's very quick. He does the little perky lips. He does the chewing, the pursing, it's his agreement. He does the tongue jut, all of these. And this is the from John Navarro's book, What Everybody's Saying. When it comes to stress, nothing is more universal than disappearing lips. So we're going to go over the next things. What do they mean? So disappearing lips would be like this. And Caitlin Albert does it a lot when she's talking about the 12-ish. Also, Nicole Albert does it. Um, Brian Albert does it. Like when it's not, it's not like closing the lips. It's like that. Pay attention to that. So this one, okay, this one we saw. Now this one is showing uh, from the book what exactly it means. So the pucker lips like this. A lot of times I would see this like in fighters and I would think this would be a challenging uh, type of expression like, you know, but I don't know. So this is what the book says here. Lip person is so accurate that it really should be given greater attention. It shows up in numerous settings and circumstances, and it is a very reliable indicator that a person is thinking alternatively or is completely rejecting what is being said. We purse our lips or pucker them when we are in disagreement with something or someone, we're thinking of a po uh, possible alternative. So the next one is the lip compression, which would be the disappearing lips. Lip compression reflects stress or anxiety may progress to the point where the lips disappear as in this photo. Uh, let me see. Tongue jutting, right, which is the one that we see him doing even during direct is when is seen when people get caught doing something they shouldn't. They screw up or they believe they're getting away with something and it is very brief. Yes, it's hard to catch these tongue jots. I have to do it in slow motion. And then finally, he looks down, which could be hesitant, nervous, avoiding eye contact. And always remembering his baseline. This is the face he was making when Lolly was asking him questions and he didn't understand. He would say, can you repeat? Or I don't know. Look at his facial expression. To me, he looks confused like he really doesn't understand what's going on but now we are going to see the variation because we are getting to the good part we're getting to cross and the i don't remembers and the i don't remembers again and a million times i don't remembers so here is the first one when he is uh, you know pretty much alan jackson comes in comes in hot right he say, listen, did you talk to somebody about your testimony? No. And then when the guy says, well, I prepped to say, excuse me, did you not just hear what I just asked you five seconds ago? Prepping is talking, sir. So were you lying then or are you lying now? And then he's like, okay, okay. I was, uh, whatever. And then he's like, no, it's not okay. Whatever. It's a yes or no, sir. I'm just kidding. That, that never happened. But here's the slide that I have to show what Colin Albert does. And this is the first time we're going to see this, a teeth exposure, which is a snarl, kind of like animals do, is saying, I'm thinking of biting you. And it's hence a primitive and potentially scary threat. So let me see if I can do this so you guys can see the tiger doing the tongue jut. <laughs> and then let's go to the video where this interaction is happening. Very first question this morning, I said, have you spoken to oh. anybody in order to prepare for your testimony? And you said, no. Yeah. So that's not true. Spoken to Mr. Lau. Okay. Yes. 
It's not okay. It's yes or not. Yes. Okay. Uh, Teeth. There you go. You said that was about a month ago. Real quick, but we see it, Colin. We see it here. So let's see what else happens during crop. And here comes the part that it is a little concerning to me. It could just mean that he's a young kid and he's not really paying attention to anything. But when he is questioned about the case and how long he has been thinking about it, his response is so empty, not vague, empty is what it is to me because he says, no, I haven't been thinking about it for two years. I've only been thinking about it when they start thinking of talking about me online, which is a little bit of a selfish and lacking compassion, right? If you're involved in something horrible like this, not involved, but you knew the guy who was your neighbor, you know, I'm just trying to put myself in that position. Something awful happened right next door. It became a big case. Everybody's talking about it. Would I have felt bad for my neighbor? Would I have reached out to the family, offered to help in any way I could? You know, would I be thinking about it? If it's it has national attention and it was like with a neighbor of mine, probably not only when people start talking about me online, you know, it was a little weird for me. So let's watch this interaction, see if you guys agree or if you have a different opinion. Let's see. That was just a month ago, right? Yes. Obviously, you've been thinking about this case quite a bit, haven't you? Yeah. Over the last two and a half years? No. How long have you been thinking about this case? Since, I guess, since people started writing about me on the internet. How about since you were at a house where an individual ended up dead on the lawn the next morning. Did that prompt you to start thinking about this case? No. Not so much, huh? A little nope. cold for me and arrogant. For me. I could be wrong. Did you speak with when and Mr. He looks at the spoke, jury now. else was there? So I'm going to pause right here. I don't know what you guys think. I just thought it just didn't sit with me well because he, he just goes like, no. Oh, so even when an individual was found out, he's like, no. The way he responded to me was a little bit like um, lacking empathy. And we'll see. But any anyway, let's look at this slide before I start talking too much. Uh, no, it changed. Let me go back. Here we go. So he, here are his faces, right? Over the last two years, he has this face uh, like the purse, purse lips. Uh, then when he says no, that's the face he makes. Uh, when he says, since people started talking about me on the internet, his face is just uh, like a straight face. To me, it was kind of like lacking emotion. We can say that, lacking emotion. I can't say empathy because I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't know what he feels, but it was kind of like, yeah, well, since people started writing about me, like no empathy, no emotion. Um, then when he's asked, how about an individual that up dead, he does the little pursing lips, like, which could be signs of frustration, disagreement. Uh, so I wrote self-centered, arrogant, lack of empathy, behavior. And then after he's done, I'm going to take myself out of here because this picture here on the bottom, he does take a look at the jury like afterwards maybe he realizes oh maybe i should have been a little bit more emotional or shown a little bit more uh that i cared a little bit more but it was it was something that caught my eye and during cross-examination we have this whole thing going on about calling albert having a video threatening a hockey team uh, because of some girls or something. Personally, okay, I think the defense was trying too hard here, and that's just my opinion. Everybody's entitled to have to having an opinion, right? So, okay, the defense is saying that possibly Colin Albert is someone that has an aggressive side and that could have gotten into a, some type of altercation with Officer John O'Keefe the night he died, and maybe he has some part in what happened. That's what the defense claims. We've had no proof of that. Now, during this part of the testimony, uh, I'm just going to mention it because it, it was a very important part of the cross. I'm not going to play the video here 
because there's a lot of cursing words and I don't know if YouTube likes that. But anyways, uh, Alan Jackson is going to press him. Didn't you tell these people you're going to F them up? You say pull up beeps. You know, you say uh, knockout, bang, bang, whatever that language is. And you can see Colin is like a young kid, you know, and he's getting nervous and he's being confronted by this male adult, real adult being aggressive with him. And he doesn't know how to take it because, you know, let's be real, guys. Normally, we're just on our phones, social media, texting or whatever. We're not face to face with the person while we're making a threat or writing something on the comment section, right? It's easier that way without a face. Now, here are his facial expressions during that interaction when he had to answer to Alan 